Week 10 is here. We have officially hit the halfway point of the season. So if you're at three and six, four and five, five and four, it's time to ramp up. Okay. This is where shit matters. If you're at one and eight, oh and nine, two and seven, brother, you got quite the hole to come out of. Hopefully these rankings will help you out. I am putting a twist on the rankings though. Recently, the past half, first half of the season, I feel like the rankings have been a little vague. I just kind of touch on a bunch of guys in the top 30, top 35. Instead of that, you will still see the graphic of my top 35 rankings, but I'm going to focus on five specific start sit questions or start sit players, guys that I want to focus on and bring info to and can dive deeper into rather than just giving you 20 random guys that I can vaguely talk about. Let me know what you think of the new style. Love it. Hate it. First time, last time, forever time. I don't know. If you're new to the channel, give us a sub, give us some love, roll the tape. Let's get into this. First start on our brand new start sit video, Mr. Brian Robinson. I am tired of the B-Rob slander. I'm done. I've had enough of it. Every week I hear about B-Rob having some type of excuse why people don't like him. It's he's facing the number one run defense. This matchup's really hard or Antonio Gibson this or Chris Rodriguez has X amount of snaps or X amount of carries. Enough. Brian Robinson is the RB9 on the season. Argue with that. OK, it's not like he's this top 25, top 20 guy. I'm trying to convince you is better than he is. He's the RB9. He's top 10. He's ahead of Bijan Robinson on the year. I don't care who he plays going forward. He's a start from here on out until something drastic actually happens. Speaking of matchups, though, I said I don't care about him. This week, he does have a favorable one. He faces the Seahawks, who on the season are giving up the 10th most points to running back and have given up the fourth most touchdowns per game to running backs. I'm in on B-Rob. You should be, too. And in this new start sit style. I'm going to be talking about not just running backs and wide receivers. I'm going to go into quarterbacks and tight ends as well. Maybe you'll like that. Maybe you won't like that. Lots of feedback is needed in this video, people. Thanks. But the number one set this week is wide receiver. We're starting off hot. Zay Flowers. I've been fading Zay in back-to-back -back weeks, and I feel like I have been spot on with him. If you're in a PPR league, Zay has been pretty decent for you, putting up double digit numbers pretty consistently, but he's still on the season has zero games with 20 points. The ceiling's not there. And the dude's coming off of a game with one catch. Do I think he'll stay that down bad? Of course not. But it's clearly proven that this Ravens passing game just is not consistent enough or strong enough to have a reliable fantasy wide receiver, which you could count on week in and week out. He's a fun player. He's a guy I like. But his best game this season was when Mark Andrews was out in week one. He popped onto the scene then. Again, still didn't even have fan 20 fantasy points. But ever since, he hasn't really gotten better. He's just matched that or been worse. Love the dude, but every week I see him in these top 20 rankings and he's outside of the top 36 wide receivers on the season. It's just a little too much love out there for Zay Flowers. I feel like I'm a Zay Flowers believer, but even this is a little too hot for me. Talking about a wide receiver I do think you should start this week or second start is Mr. Debo Samuel. This one might be a little obvious, but I can still see some hesitancy out there because Debo's, Debo's risky. He's, he's put up some duds. However, he's been practicing in full this week and I don't know if anyone's noticed. Ever since Debo's been out, the Niners have been 0-3. There's a correlation there if you're asking me. Can't prove it, but maybe a Debo Samuel appearance this weekend versus a tough Jaguars team will show, hey, maybe this guy, we do need him after all. He's averaging 14 points per game on the season in PPR leagues, and I think with him practicing in full right away on Monday, it showed he didn't even really need the bye week to be fully rested. It just added on to that, so he's going to be 110% ready to go. I'm no doctor. I'm talking out of my ass a little bit on that, but vibes-wise, I think the, the, the bye was more than we needed, and it's just a nice chair on top to throw into his health speaking of the jags this is a favorable matchup they give up the 11th most points to wide receivers the 12th most yards per reception we love a little yak love for debo and they give up the six most touchdowns to wide receivers per game on the year but we're not just we're just gonna we're gonna dive a little bit deeper than that we're not just talking vaguely wide receivers when it comes to outside wide receivers guys that are out wide which debo primarily does on the year the jaguars give up not the 10th most 11th most top five most they give up the most fantasy points to wide outs slot guys jags got a little bit under control but boys that are out far they get cooked they give up the most points and debo's gonna cook and eat right on his bounce back 
when he's looking fully healthy again. Going back to wide receivers in the sit region, this might be another obvious one, so I'll make it quick. The rest, no more obvious ones. At this point for me, George Pickens is a sit. In the past two games, he's got three catches. I will say maybe you could play into the narrative like, oh, he's been very known to be upset about his usage. It's been seen on television. It's been seen on his social media accounts. He's making it known, hey, I'm not happy. They could force feed him. But I'm just, I'm someone that I don't want to bet on a drama queen having a good game. I like Pickens. I think he's a good player, but I don't want to get into the drama and therefore I'm avoiding him, especially with his recent performances. Last week, he basically put up a dud. The week before, he had one catch. You're lucky if you had him on your lineups that he got you a touchdown to at least give you something. Without that tutty, you're looking at a zero point game from Pickens. Deontay is clearly the alpha in this wide receiver room when it comes to usage. He's out targeted Pickens in 29 to 18 since his comeback. Again, drama queen, not for me. Packers, I will say monitor the Jair Alexander injury. Jair's out. If this defense is banged up, if the Packers are banged up, the matchup becomes more favorable and I am more open to it. But on the season... The Packers have given up the ninth fewest points and the eighth fewest yards to wide receivers. That stat alone makes me want to stray away from them. But if there's no Jair Alexander, that's a whole different story. I'm more open to it. But all around, given the current circumstances, he's a no-go for me. Sticking with the Steelers, though, I'm not fading all Steelers. I do like one Steeler on this team, and I'm starting... Jalen Warren. Najee Harris, you're not my guy. Jalen Warren, you are. On the year in PPR, Jalen Warren's outscored Najee. He's averaging more points per game than Najee. He's averaging more yards per carry, more yards per reception, more yards per touch than Najee. He might just be better than Najee. And the Steelers are kind of finally realizing this. If you look at the usage between Jalen Warren and Najee, it favors Jalen. When it comes to anytime the Steelers got to buckle up and win, third down, long down and distance, two minute drill, Jalen's getting the usage over Najee. And earlier, I just pointed out the fact that the Packers are a pretty Pretty tough matchup for wide receivers when it comes to running backs it's pretty favorable on the season to running backs the Packers give out the ninth most points the eighth most rushing yards the eighth most receptions and the tenth most receiving yards all things Jalen Warren excels in he's better than Najee he needs to be above Najee he is above Najee and he needs to be in your lineup our third sit of the week is Gus Edwards I'm, I'm really sticking with the same bunch of guys talk about Zay Flowers talked about Pickens talked about Warren now Gus the bus Gus ain't it for me he's even a sell for me he's averaging 20 fantasy points per game he has zero receiving upside he has six catches on the season and he's extremely touchdown reliant in half ppr this year when gus edwards doesn't score a touchdown he doesn't have a single game with more than six points I'm not even talking double digits if he doesn't score you can't even expect six fantasy points from him is that a guy you want on your team no is he going to score another touchdown this year? Yes. That's not something I want to bank on every single week and just cross my fingers on. And notice I'm fading Gus Edwards and I didn't even mention the fact that the Ravens rookie running back just popped off for 138 rushing yards on the ground. There's a lot of reasons to fade Gus. Keaton Mitchell is finally healthy and the dude cooked in his little bit of a, it wasn't his debut, but it was his grand opening and I would be a little fearful if I was a Gus owner. I'm fading him. I'm selling them. I'm getting rid of them, especially this week against the Browns. We'll give up the fourth fewest points to running backs. That's a sit and that's a sell because his value after putting up probably less than six points this week isn't going to be the most attractive player to sell on the market. All right, enough Ravens and Steelers talk. My goodness. Told you I would talk about some quarterbacks and I promised. This guy I am passionate about. I have love for and I don't know why, but Joshua Dobbs is a must start. He is QB 10 on the season, a QB 10. It doesn't matter if he's on the Cardinals, the Vikings, whatever. QB 10, you can't argue with that. And before this week, somehow, Joshua Dobbs was only owned in like 20% of leagues. What the hell is going on there? This brother hasn't been owned when he's been a top 10 QB on the season. That's outrageous. The counter argument to Joshua Dobbs is, oh, this week he has a tough matchup versus the Saints. He had a tough matchup versus the Ravens two weeks ago who gave up the second fewest points to quarterbacks. Guess what he did? Dropped 25 on their dome. He didn't drop 25 real points there. The Cardinals still lost, but he dropped 25 fantasy points. That's what matters for me and you. And I don't want you to look at Joshua Dobbs like a Justin Herbert, like a Lamar Jackson, like a Tua, like a Josh Allen. But when you have those quarterbacks on your fantasy team, you don't go, oh, I'm going to sit Josh Allen this week because he's got a tough matchup versus the blah, blah, blah team. Josh Dobbs isn't that elite, but he's a top 10 Q fantasy QB. So you should be looking at him with the mentality of, I don't really give a shit who he plays. He's been there. He's done that. Since week two, he's averaging 18 fantasy points per game this year that's more than purdy that's more than goff that's more than trevor lawrence all i'm saying josh Dobbs isn't at a elite level but he's damn near close 
and he's a must start moving forward. As I mentioned, Jay Jet is going to be back soon. Not this week. I'm no one's starting sitting this week, but he's a guy I wouldn't mind being invested in. All right, this is a guy I'm not passionate for. I'm infamously wrong about this guy. Sit of the week. This. I said I'd stop with the obvious ones. I, I don't know. Whatever. Zach Moss. I hate myself for waving the white flag on Zach Moss last week. I gave in last week and admitted Zach Moss is going to have a role. He might just be a good fantasy back after all. This is a committee back fill in Indy. As soon as I do that, as soon as I give up, the usage goes out the ass for JT. He becomes the alpha RB1, the thoroughbred, the top G, the top dog, and Zach Moss sits back in the back seat and watches. I'm glad I'm right finally, but it's just, it's just not the same. It's, it's just a little sour taste. JT last week led in snaps, targets, rush attempts, whatever you want to look at. The usage now favors in JT since his return. Gut will throw up some graphics so you can see the specific numbers. Is Jack Moss going to get some goal line work? Is he going to score another touchdown this year? Kind of like Gus Edwards. Yes, but it's clear they are handing off the baton. And if you're a Jonathan Taylor owner, I'd be very, very happy. Zach Moss, if you're an owner of him, celebrate. Be grateful for what you did get out of him this season. He's been like a top 10 running back on the year so far. But the dog days are here and the Zach Moss days are over. AKA sit his ass. The final start, kind of a gross one. I ain't gonna lie. I'm gonna I'm preface you with that. Start Alexander Madison. Ugh, I know. It's wow, I am really sticking with the same teams, aren't I? Joshua Dobbs, Alexander Madison on the Vikings. We're talking about Jalen Warren and Pickens. Talking about Zay Flowers and Gus Edwards. Alexander Madison, start him. Look, I don't think Alexander Madison is great. I don't. But is he RB24 in the season? He's an RB2. That's what you draft him to be, and that's what he's doing. Me and Nick were talking about this the other day. You're not getting consistent play out of Madison like you would want, but you're getting a little up and downs to where if you average it out, it doesn't look consistent, but it is consistent, and it's a decent play. RB2 numbers. Saints are a tough matchup. However, volume is king. On the season, Alexander Madison is 11th in carries and 10th in targets. This tough Saints matchup just allowed Deontay Foreman to average four yards per carry on him last week. He had 20 carries. He went for about 80 yards. He didn't have a crazy day, but he had enough evidence to where I believe in Alexander Madison, especially with the Cam Akers injury. This Vikings team is scrappy. Joshua Dobbs gives him some juice. Could Madison get his first rushing touchdown of the season? I'm not sprinkling any money on that, but I'm sure you could get that at like some plus 8,000 odds somewhere. I think he's see similar usage and similar success that Deontay Foreman had last week. And the Vikings are better at run blocking than the Bears. It's not apples to apples comparison. It's going to be different games, schematics, styles, but fifth and run blocking on the year. It's a positive. Volume is king. That's the hill I'm dying on when it comes to Alexander Madison this week. Final set. We're talking about a tight end. And would you look at that? I didn't even notice till now. We're sticking with the AFC North for whatever weird reason I have this week to stick with the same matchups. David Njoku. Sit his ass. Similar to Zach Moss. If you started him last week, I'm glad you were able to turn that lemon into sour lemonade and get the 12 fantasy points you got out of him. I don't want to hear, well, he had six targets and he had a touchdown. That's good. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Quit while you're ahead, okay? Heading into week 10 isn't the week to double down and run it back and start him again. And if you missed out on him last week, you threw him on the bench and now you're like, shit, is he going to have a back-to-back -back week good, good fantasy performance? And now you want to start him because you have FOMO, fear of missing out? No, don't chase, okay? David Njoku needs to be on your bench. The Ravens give up the second fewest fantasy points to tight ends. And if you want to get into the deep numbers, I don't have a concrete take on this yet, but it's something I'm uh, looking to build off of as the sample size grows. Since Deshaun Watson's return, so I'm not going into like the Baker Mayfield days because I, I want it to be the sample size we want to look at. Since Deshaun Watson has been a Cleveland Brown, David Njoku performs better when he's not with Watson than when he is. Without Watson, he averages about two extra fantasy points per game. It's an extra catch a game and he gets about 17 extra yards a game. It's a little something. You could chalk it up to be what you want. Oh, well, Deshaun was hurt. Deshaun is rusty. Look, I wanted Deshaun to bounce back too this year, but I don't think we're ever going to get the Texan Deshaun ever again. Just is what it is. Again, tough matchup. Baltimore, take him out. No more lemonade out of David Njoku. That lemon is sour. Get rid of the peel. Get rid of the rind. Get rid of it all. Get rid of the juice. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my top five, top bottom five starts and sits of the week. Again, let me know what you thought of this new style. Hopefully, you could still get a decent picture of what my overall rankings are of the week. But if you are a little confused, hey, I didn't talk about this player, and I usually do. Now you want to see where they are. You can find the full rankings of everyone I talked about and everyone you want to know about every quarterback every running back every wide receiver wide receivers one through a million you even want to know my opinions on some defenses and kickers you can find the full rankings at bdg.co you'll find the full rankings not just this week but every week you can also find nick's waiver wire rankings there as well they could pick up 
and look at on Mondays. That's all she wrote. Give me some feedback. What do you think of this new style? Say goodbye to the dinos. Say goodbye to Gut for editing this. We love Gut. Show him some appreciation in the comments as well, not just my beautiful face up here on the camera. Enough yapping, enough talking. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, and of course, thank you and good night. Thank <laughs> you.